The following accounts have been submitted by subscribers. These stories are claimed to describe true events. I ask you to listen in good faith and decide for yourself what to believe. I am once again honoured to invite the horror narrator Mortis Media to aid in the narrations of these stories. So sit back and enjoy. I live in a rural area, a beautiful and lush patch of land situated in the Florida Panhandle. I've always had an interest in the paranormal, but have never really put much thought into the idea that I would be wrapped up in the middle of an occurrence like this. I head into work around 4pm and come home at midnight, and never tend to come home early unless it's unavoidable. I also must mention that I live two houses down from my grandparents, which will become a relevant factor in this story. At around 8pm one night several weeks ago, my grandparents received a knock on their door. Not expecting such a late visitor, my grandfather cracked the door slightly to see what looked like me standing there on the doorstep, lit only by the dim porch light. Immediately, my grandfather knew something was wrong. It looked and sounded like me, but it moved wrong. He later told me that its symmetry was off, like it shouldn't exist in a three-dimensional space. Not only that, its colours were washed out. It was hard for him to tell in the dim glow of the porch light, but its colours seemed muted. It had my blonde hair and skin complexion, but it seemed faded somehow, like turning the saturation down on a photograph. As my grandfather looked at it, peering round from behind the door, he noticed that its eyes never once focused on him or anything in particular. Not sure how to respond, he stared at what looked like me for a long moment. Eventually, it looked at him, with its glazed over eyes, and mumbled, It's me. Let me in. This is what struck my grandfather the most, its tone. I'm a very expressive person in both speech and mannerisms, so it didn't seem at all normal to him when this thing spoke in a flat tone and didn't emote with its face. When my grandfather didn't respond, it repeated itself. Growing increasingly anxious, my grandfather leaned into the house and asked my grandmother to come over and help him deal with the situation. On her way to the door, my grandmother passed the kitchen window overlooking the next few houses and noticed that my car was not in my driveway. She knew then that I, the real one, was still at work. Not bothering to give a proper response, she hastily pushed the door closed and locked it, much to my grandfather's surprise. After explaining the situation to him, my terrified grandparents sat in their kitchen, lights on, for the next few hours, too scared to go to bed. For around 45 minutes, they would occasionally hear a light tapping at the door and a muffled, It's me, let me in. In the days afterwards, when my grandparents told me their story, I was shocked. My grandparents are not people to fabricate stories or up until now even believe in the paranormal. Because of this, I wholeheartedly believed them when they relayed their story to me. They explained to me that they didn't quite know what to expect if they let it in but gut instinct told them it couldn't be anything good. It, however, the thing that looked like me, was insistent on wanting to get inside, so it clearly had an idea of what it wanted to do. When I asked my grandmother why she thought it wanted to come inside, she somewhat sheepishly admitted that she thought it may have wanted to kill them. As for me, I believe it was a flesh gate. To my understanding, flesh gates are creatures similar to skinwalkers, but instead of animals, they tend to favour imitating humans. In this particular case, and for whatever reason, the creature favoured imitating me. I am only glad that my grandparents refused to let it in. Before I can explain the circumstances, I must ensure you that the story I am about to tell is not in the slightest way fabricated. I know it may seem strange that I would turn to you, but I had no other choice. Writing this down is the only way I can keep my sanity. I want to stay anonymous and make sure 
that in no way this story would be linked with my name. However, I believed it necessary to explain the things I saw to somebody, in hopes that they would listen. I am a student at a university in the north of England, and throughout my life, I've always enjoyed camping. Being an avid reader introduced me to the works of Jack London, and since then, I've always found a connection with going outdoors alone, to get away from society for a short while. During the winter of 2017, I planned to make my first international trip, to the Great White North of Norway. I'd made trips around the UK previously, and to say the least, I would consider myself an experienced wild camper slash survivalist. After leaving university for Christmas, I decided to spend the majority of December in a Norwegian national park, known as Hardangavida. I had planned the trip many months before, and I had saved up enough for flights and all the equipment necessary for a winter camp. The first three days, the temperature was below freezing, and the weather was bad, and it did not seem to be about to change any time soon. Nonetheless, I continued on with my trip, and headed further east towards a lake called Nordmanslagen. En route to said lake, rain started to fall heavily on my position, so I was forced to retire to a small forest area at the base of a nearby mountain. Night and day are seldom opposites when you're so close to the Arctic Circle. So in turn, darkness and rain engulfed the valley. I made up camp quickly and started a fire to keep warm. I donned some warmer clothes and set my wet ones to dry before the next day of travel. As the night passed on, I ate some warm food and began to read in fashion with all of the camping trips I go on. No other human would be around for at least a 20 mile radius, so solitude was mine for however briefly. I never fit the dark. I've never feared being alone. I've never been scared of monsters, ghosts, demons, or anything otherwise. For those things didn't exist in my mind at this point. But what happened next will exist in my mind until I die. I sat there besides the fire reading. I heard movement come from the darkness. If you've had a fire going at night, you'll know that you have limited vision after staring into the flames for so long. I knew this land didn't have the safe luxuries of home, so I instantly got up and went for my bowie knife. I stood there knife in hand, staring into the pitch black, thinking of all the animals it could be, big or small. In that moment, I heard a noise, a noise much different to that of a snapping of a branch or moving of feet. It was a sombre, deep groaning sound, with a hint of rumbling laughter. But not human laughter. Instead, it sounded like the laughter of a big chimpanzee or a gorilla. A constant inhaling, an exhaling of air. No words can describe how I felt at this moment. Fear ripped through me and I could only wait, staring into the darkness. Then, in a suddenness, like that of a power cut in your house at night, the noise stopped, and all that remained was the dripping sound of rain coming from the forest canopy. After this, my instincts kicked in, almost like I ignored what I had just heard, and decided to focus on securing myself and the camp. I heaved my belongings into a tree, and pulled my hammock up away from the ground, and higher up the tree. I fed the fire enough to keep it roaring for a few hours. Then, I started to drink 
more and more water, so that I could urinate as much as possible, and in doing so turn away any animals. With that, I felt better again. Foolishly, I ignored the idea of what I heard, and put it down to fatigue or some small animal. After all, I couldn't exactly break camp and leave, because of how far away I was from any town. Therefore, my brain put the thing I heard to the back of my consciousness, to give me a chance of sleeping peacefully. And that I did, for a few hours at least. I fed the fire and listened to the forest, but no sounds came. Whatever animal I had heard was now gone, or so I hoped. I dropped off to sleep in the hammock at around half twelve. I awoke in blackness. The fire was down to embers, and complete darkness surrounded me. I checked my watch. 2.30 a.m. Why I awoke, I do not know. A feeling, perhaps. A sense of impending calamity. Whatever it was, I am glad for it. For as my eyes adjusted to the dark, I saw something that would drive anyone to madness. I cannot begin to explain what it was. The mere memory of it has me looking over my shoulders even now. At a tree behind the campfire, a pair of deep orange eyes peered at me through the darkness. I wasn't sure that I was dreaming, but when the eyes stepped out towards my failing fire, I knew I wasn't. The sound from earlier started again, and it came from a wide, smiling mouth and the thing near the fire. Ape-like and hunched over, it still towered upwards of seven feet. I don't know if it knew I was there, or if it was just curious, but it seemed to want to play a game making that god-awful noise and staring in my direction. It started to nod its body up and down, like it was dancing. Then it stopped, as if interrupted by something. I think it noticed me then. It felt as if its eyes met mine. Anger was etched upon its face. Madness. Lunacy of some kind, like it didn't want to be seen. For the first time in my short life, I felt like I was going to die. Like this thing was going to kill me with ease, and leave my body to be washed over by January frost. But it didn't. It simply walked backwards into the darkness, eyes fixed on me. What happened next is a fainter memory as being born. I remember breaking camp and heading off straight away. Resting when I could but mostly heading onwards, determined to get back to town, so that I could get a taxi to the airport and return home. Upon arriving home, I wasn't the same. Christmas was strange. My family asked me what was wrong, but I couldn't say. I didn't have photos to share, only my recollections. Since I returned home, I've done nothing but research this thing, and apparently there are other stories like mine. There are similarities between my experience and those with something people call a skunk ape. Whatever this creature might have been, I haven't slept well for a long time, and I dare not walk the wilds, not even in my homeland. The terrible sound of the thing breathing and laughing in the darkness has given me nightmares. I'm not sure if you'll believe me, or if you even do believe in anomalies like this, but all I can say is everything that I have told you is true. I don't usually share this story. The only people who know are the others involved, and a handful of friends. It's always haunted us, and although we've tried to find out anything we can about it, nothing seems to fit. 
I live in a small town in central Wisconsin, and it's always been the kind of place where kids would run around in small packs until midnight or later, since your neighbours were typically like an extended family. You have to understand first off that we all grew up in the country surrounded by woods. We knew the land, and we knew the wildlife of that area, and what we saw was no animal. Like I said, it wasn't uncommon for kids to stay out late, until even two or three in the morning around my home. It was about that late, and six of us, including myself, were still playing ghosts in the graveyard. I don't want to use their real names, since I've drifted apart from a few of them since the incident, so I've changed the names of those involved. We were playing in the woodlot behind Sam and David's house, and if you're unfamiliar with the game, you simply hide, then try to reach a safe point without being tagged. I'm a dark-skinned girl with crazy brown hair, so it was always easy for me to hide in the underbrush of the forest since I blended in well. I went over by the fence near the neighbour's property line and hid in the small ditch by the posts. It was pretty isolated, but I could still hear Sam trying to find people in the distance. I had been lying there for a good 10 to 15 minutes when I heard the crunch of footsteps a few feet away from me. It was strange since I was listening carefully for Sam and I hadn't heard anyone walking anywhere around me before that moment. I figured someone might have been up a tree and jumped down, but when I looked up it wasn't anyone. Instead, there were these two humanoid beings, way taller than any person I'd ever met. They had to be around eight feet, since their heads reached almost past the lower boughs of the pines. They had white faces with lips but no nose and their eyes were just dark, like holes without lids. What scared me more was that it was clearly not a mask or paint, since the white was nearly iridescent and there wasn't any plastic shine. Instead of clothing, they just had these black, cloak-like masses. It didn't look like cloth, it just sort of coated around their faces and came down to the ground. Even more frightening than their appearance was the fact that they made no sounds, aside from some rustling in the underbrush when they first appeared. Anyone who has lived near a forest before knows that when it's quiet, it's quiet. You hear everything, even your own heartbeat. But they didn't breathe. There were no shifting sounds. They were just there. They weren't moving, and being a kid I still thought these things had to be people. They just stood there staring at me like they were waiting for me to do something. I was really stupid, and I should have just run screaming as soon as I saw them, but I was too scared to move. I remember it vividly, and I got up the courage and said, Hello? questioningly. When that got no response, I repeated myself more timidly. I've gone through a lot in my life, but I've never been so scared as I was right then. Then there was this moment like some weird buzz in the air where I just knew that they were talking. I can't really explain it, but it's like the feeling you get when two magnets try to touch each other. They were talking about me. I just didn't know what about. Suddenly, they just started fighting with one another. It was synchronized, with both of them reaching and grabbing at the other at the same time. But there was still no sound. It was like someone had muted the television except for that slight movement they caused on the ground. I ran after that. I was crying hysterically and calling for help. Anyone who knows me knows I don't do that. I don't cry or get overtly emotional. I'm the rock that everyone else goes to in a crisis situation. I was the oldest in our friendship group besides David, who was Sam's older brother and not really a friend, and had practically raised some of these kids even though I was only 13. I don't get scared, but I was terrified then. Of course Sam came running, and Ethan followed since he was already caught. They tried to ask me what was going on, but I could barely get it out. Seeing them gave me back some courage though, and I called out for Johnny and Abigail to get back to the house. Abigail came running back from the church lot down the street. She was crying, because she had seen them too. She's always been like a surrogate daughter to me, and I remember her shaking. We were grouped up by the back porch when we heard Johnny scream. He came out to us, and his arm was scratched and bleeding. He said he didn't know what happened, but something had tried to grab him. We ran inside and woke up David. Sam locked all the doors, and although I felt a bit better inside, I was still freaking out, since these kids, my kids, 
was still in danger. Of course, David and Ethan weren't all that quick to believe us, David because he was skeptical, and Ethan because he was scared. Like Sam though, David took it more seriously when he saw how shaken up I was. Like I said, I'm not one to get shaken up. The gun case was locked because Sam and David's parents were out of town, but they both played baseball and grabbed their bats. I didn't want to go back out there, but David said I needed to show them where they were. Sam went with me, and stayed behind us as I walked them back to the fence. But they had disappeared. It was a relief, but when we got back inside the house and looked out the windows, we could see more of them, just staring at us from the edge of the woods. Their white faces were bright in the dark. All of us just huddled up in the living room, terrified. We were there for a couple of hours. Abigail kept trying to get me to take her home. She was still crying and worked up, and although I wanted to get her home, she was about a mile away and would have to go on foot. It was getting close to 4am though, and my mother called, screaming at me to get home before hanging up. I remember we went to the garage together, and just looked out. We didn't see them, but none of us were certain that meant that they weren't there. Ethan and Johnny were the closest besides me. They both ran, and I could see Johnny make it to his driveway in the distance. It was lighter out, and I had somewhat recovered. I told Sam to go back inside, and made the executive decision to walk Abigail home. He didn't want to let us go, but I was older and felt responsible for him. He made me take his bat though. Abigail and I ended up running for a while, but I wasn't the fastest person to begin with and she was exhausted. It still took us a good 20 minutes to get back to her apartment. We got there, and then I walked back alone without incident. I don't think we ever played in the woods again after that. Ethan moved away, David and Sam became jerks. So the only two I'm still close to are Johnny and Abigail. It took a while, and honestly I thought I had imagined the whole thing, but about a month later, I had Johnny and Abigail sleep over, and I brought it up. The night we had seen those things. They remembered it, and then Johnny showed me the scar on his arm, and Abigail told me they'd been in the small wood behind her house a couple of times since then, like they were keeping watch. I thought I was crazy, but then hearing them confirm everything kind of made me wish I was. I only saw them once or twice after that myself. Like Abigail's experience, it felt like they were keeping watch more than anything else. What's weird is what happened after this. I just felt more connected to everything around me. I thought ESP, ghosts and all of that stuff were just people being scared, sick or insane. But now that I had a taste of it for myself, it was like I couldn't go back. My sister went to see a psychic later on and dragged me with her. The woman we saw, and everyone I've met since then, always tells me I was touched by something, and that I was special. Again, I thought it was nonsense, but I started doing fake fortunes at summer camp, since I figured I could copy what they did. It wasn't even with tarot cards, just a regular deck of cards, or reading their hands. I would see images in my head, brush it off as imagination, but then when I described them to the people I was reading, they all seemed completely shocked, and would tell me how it was true. This wasn't that horoscope stuff either, you know how you can say things that apply to anyone. No. I saw a boy in a blue jacket next to a red pickup truck crying on the ice, and the girl I was giving the reading to told me about how her little brother had broken his ankle. I would pick cards seemingly at random from the deck, and make up some nonsense about how this meant there was a family conflict between this girl, a sibling, and some guy in a baseball cap, only for them to get mad and ask who told me about it. It freaked me out, and so I stopped until about two years ago, when I went to college and met my friend Christina, who was president of Pagan Forum and did her own divination. I remember telling her about the black and white people, as we ended up calling the tall things, and the weird stuff that had happened afterwards. She helped me figure out how to use my abilities, and I've been helping people ever since. I've got stronger, and now that I have experience I can tell that when I read a person, it's that same magnetic sensation as those things had when they were talking about me. I can't say for sure, and I know this whole thing is really hard to believe, but I think whatever came after us that night left something behind. I am a senior citizen now, and this occurred when I was four years old. This was told to me 
at different times. When I was in my late teens, and when I was in my early twenties. First by my older brother and sister, and then my mother. The story I am about to relate happened in the mid-1950s in Buffalo, New York. We lived with my mother and grandmother on the second floor of an old rat-infested apartment house with holes and crumbling plaster in the walls and ceiling. It was a common practice for my grandmother to position rat traps at the baseboards. Cheese was never used, but poisoned meat was. My sister once got her hand snapped in one and was scarred for life. My grandfather's brother and his family lived across the hall from us. It was accepted that strange things would happen in that house that freaked out the tenants on both floors. The neighborhood itself was multicultural with a wide variety of income levels and lots of businesses. The house is gone now, but it stood on a busy corner of Sycamore Street, a major thoroughfare that travelled east to west and a side street I can't remember the name of. Imagine a time when small business owners still used horse-drawn wagons and visited their customers door to door. Like when the Iceman would deliver for your rice box using huge ice tongs and protected his back with a thick layer of burlap. The scissor man would stop by with his grinding wheel and waited for the housewives to bring out their utensils to sharpen knives and whatever else needed treatment. Motorcyclists rode around carrying huge saddlebags with silver accents on their vehicles. The milkman in his distinctive truck delivered glass bottles filled with milk or cream straight from the dairy. Across the side street and down the block was the local playground complete with sandbox, slide, swings and a self-propelled carousel that you would have to run while holding onto and then jump onto seesaws and a maypole. The neighbourhood children all took advantage of any warm weather or day off school to gather there and play. My brother and sister were always allowed to go to the playground whenever conditions were right. But being so young at three or four, I always had to wait until my siblings happened to be in the mood to take me there. I often overheard them and their friends talking, and sometimes I heard them relating spooky stories to each other. Whether these were real or made up, I couldn't know. They had really good storytelling skills. My brother and sister also told stories to me at home, and I never knew if I should believe them or not. So years later, when they told me this story, I didn't know what to think until my mum told me the same thing a few years later. One spring afternoon, we three were in our room for nap time. Mum was in the living room at the front of the apartment. Our room was in the back. The bedroom was large enough to hold a full bed, a bunk bed, a chest of drawers for our clothes, a dresser, and a couple of full toy boxes. My siblings couldn't sleep and played between the top bunk and the full bed across the room. I was asleep on the bottom bunk. They described being distracted by what they thought was smoke pushing down from the large hole in the ceiling. The smoke flowed down to the floor and became a column until it finally formed a female shape and became a woman, who my siblings said looked like a witch. They said she wore long dark robes and had a hunched back. As they watched, this woman skulked over to my bed and knelt down at my head watching me and totally ignoring them. According to their descriptions, she had a hooked nose and her chin jutted up and out towards her nose. And she had warts. Her hair was thin and loose and hung past her shoulders and they said that they could even see her scalp. 
Her long, bony fingers reached out for me as my brother and sister watched in horror. She ignored them as they shouted at her to leave me alone and not to touch me. They became frantic. They called for mom to come and help and make this woman stop. Their shouts and cries got so loud that my mother finally came to the back and was about to get angry at them for playing and being loud when she stopped short just inside the door. She told me years later that my siblings looked terrified. They were pointing at me, at the ceiling, and gripping their beds, and very near tears. They told her that just as she got to the doorway, the smoke withdrew and sucked backwards up into the ceiling, leaving no trace but the smell of something having been burnt, which my mum too could smell. I never woke up, sleeping through the entire incident. Afterwards, I put an illustration of this in my colouring book, along with other occurrences from my and my family's past experiences in that building. I am now in my 60s, and will never forget what they said happened to me so many years ago. Thank you for listening, and thank you to the people who have so kindly and courageously allowed me to share their experiences. Thank you also to Mortis Media for helping me to narrate. Please be sure to visit his channel and watch the other half of our collaboration. Also, if you haven't done so already, why not watch another of Mort and I's collaborations? Simply follow the links on screen now. Until next time. <laughs>